All right, thank you, Stephen. Uh, pleasure to see you all again. I um, hope you're enjoying the conference. So today we're gonna talk about um, Hyler strictures, which can be some of the most difficult ERCPs that we face. And particularly, I'm gonna focus first on just some perspectives and considerations. And first of all, we're gonna focus on malignant Hyler strictures, just in the interest of time and simplicity. Um, but it's anything but simple. And a lot of what I'm gonna share is based not just on what data and guidelines there may be available, but often the management of Hyler strictures is guided by your mentorship and your own experiences and how your partners would manage these. And really it is a little bit of a, of a, of a consensus topic rather than something that's strongly guided by data. But I'll point out a few areas where we do have data. And in particular, we're gonna start by talking about first whether you're considering a Hyler stricture as a preoperative drainage procedure or if this is a patient that's never gonna make it to surgery, and we'll talk about why, why that's important. Then we'll go into procedure planning and what to think about before attacking a Hyler stricture, the goals of stenting, uh, how to pick a stent and where to place them, and then some tips and techniques to accomplish those goals. Now we know the, the classification system here, the bismuth correlate classification, where um, it helps us kind of define and describe a stricture, particularly for reports and how you might manage it. But um, one and two are kind of mostly involving the, the common hepatic duct with two abutting the hilum uh, and the bifurcation, while 3A goes up the right hepatic duct and 3B up the left hepatic duct, and then type four, the complex bilateral kind of involvement. Um, now, when we, first face, let's say, a fresh hyalur stricture, the most important thing is to not assume that that patient is not a surgical candidate. Used to be in the old days, cholangiocarcinoma, even potentially with uh, you know, large size tumors at the hilum was uh, a death sentence. But these days with modern surgical techniques, that's not necessarily true. And uh, it's the reason that it's so important to know upfront whether there's any remote possibility of surgery is to avoid poking through the capsule of the liver because of concerns about peritoneal seating. So if you're not sure, then err on the side of not poking through the liver capsule. So no percutaneous biopsy of a hilar mass, no EUS guided poking through the hilum uh, or through the capsule into the hilum. Um, and, and it's important until you know for sure. So making sure it's metastatic or you've had a multidisciplinary discussion with hepatobiliary surgery, surgical oncology, or whatever other colleagues at your institution may manage this. And some of those surgical options include aggressive surgeries like extended hepatectomy or radical resection. At centers like UCLA, they will actually consider liver transplant. And it's based on more than just where the tumor is and the size. They'll look at vascular involvement, they'll look at healthy segments, um, they could do things like portal vein embolization to actually induce hypertrophy of healthy areas of the liver to then remove the areas where the tumor are involved. So this is just a big kind of just, you know, asterisk before attacking a hyalur stricture. Don't assume that it's just uh, non-surgical just because of uh, kind of initial impressions. Now, uh, if you do know that it's not going to be surgical, then we'll kind of take it from here. So in terms of procedure planning, I would generally recommend some kind of cross-sectional imaging, either CAT scan or MRI, to get a game plan and a roadmap of what ducts you may be wanting to stent during your ERCP. But it, going beyond that, the other advantage of having some kind of cross-sectional imaging is to assess the liver volume. And instead of just thinking about left and right, thinking about the different segments or sectors. And we're going to look into that in detail in a minute. And then also, if it is the index procedure, what is going to be your strategy to get tissue if you need to get a diagnosis in addition to draining that liver? And uh, options may include if you have access to EUS, FNA, um, maybe you can't go after the hyalur mass, but maybe there are lymph nodes nearby that you can poke to get the diagnosis. Or while you're doing ERCP, you could do brushings or go with cholangioscopy with direct biopsies, which is my favorite approach whenever possible. Now, a, a review briefly of the liver segmental anatomy. So, um, you know, it's kind of like a clockwise. Uh, so we have the left lobe, and then on the right side, you see five, six, seven, eight going around. And you'll notice that the right anterior ducts up at the top kind of get the more medial aspect of the right lobe, while the right posterior duct goes towards the lateral aspects of the lobe. And uh, looking at it a different way, just remember that there are variants of our ductal anatomy. So type one there is probably the most common where the right posterior duct goes posterior to the right anterior duct and joins it to form the right hepatic duct. But in about a quarter of patients, it's actually possible that the right posterior duct will actually join on the left. And then there's other variants such as the trifurcation and others out there. And this is kind of, um, it's, it's more important than we realize. And we don't often think of this necessarily when we're starting an ERCP, but this is starting to get into what I'm gonna dig into next, which is that it's more important than just left and right. Because for example, in that, in that type 3A, if you just put a stent on the ref, left and the right, 
and you're not actually getting into the right posterior segment, that may be a significant portion of the liver that's not being well drained. So it goes a little bit beyond just left and right or bilateral stenting, which again, we'll dig into in a minute. Now, before we get there, what are the actual goals of stenting? So number one is uh, optimization prior to chemotherapy or surgery. So if there's surgery plan, the, the liver surgeons don't like to operate on a, on a duct under pressure. You know, it's going to affect the reanastomosis and make their surgery a lot harder. But oftentimes when we're talking about non-surgical candidates, the goal is often for the oncologist to get to a, a, hemo, a, a bilirubin level where they could actually still give chemotherapy. And not all chemotherapies need a normal bilirubin. And so there are times where we'll have a discussion saying, do you really need us to go after this or can you just start treatment or change your treatment plan? Uh, and, and, and that's that essentially what's written here. We also will do this for palliative purposes for patients who have col uh, cholestasis-related pruritus or if they have cholangitis, of course, to drain the infection. So it's more than just getting the number down. It's getting the number down and getting the ducts drain towards uh, some kind of goal. And Without these, sometimes, you know, it may be appropriate not to do an ERCP, but to rather start an alternative treatment. Now, let's get into how many stents to place. Well, it's actually believed that you only need about 25 to 50% of healthy liver that needs to be drained in order to palliate the bilirubin and get the bilirubin biochemically normal. So even though there may be undrained segments or dilated ducts, if you have enough drainage of viable liver, biochemically, you may achieve the goal and still allow that patient to, for example, start chemotherapy. And there's many studies that kind of have looked at this. Um, unfortunately, with this topic, these studies are quite heterogeneous, often single center or retrospective. But in general, the guidelines have kind of taken this to suggest that multiple stent placement is preferred over unilateral stent placement because of increase in duration of patency and also in overall success of drainage. So when possible, try to put multiple stents. Now, you'll notice I didn't write unilateral versus bilateral. And I think that that's starting to become a little bit of an outdated idea and the reason why is from this uh, interesting study from 2010, where they looked at a, 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 just over 100 patients with hyalur strictures that were undergoing plastic stenting. They had a CT scan performed and used the CT scan to volumetrically divide the liver into three segments, the left side, the right anterior segment, and the right posterior segment. And then they took those three segments or sectors, and if that segment was less than 30% of the total liver volume, or if more than uh, three-fourths of that segment was involved by tumor, they define that segment as atrophic, so not really you know, doing much for, for that patient. And what they found is that if more than 50% of the total volume of the liver was drained, it was a strong predictor for effective drainage and also associated with longer survival. They also found that if you went after those atrophic segments, so either it was not a big portion of the liver, less than 30%, or more than three-fourths of that, 75% or more, was involved by tumor, not only did it not work, but it was associated with higher rate of complications, particularly cholangitis. So when we take this patient, which was not long ago, Dr. Kim and I, you know, at UCLA Santa Monica saw, um, and we see the MRCP was read as severe left intrahepatic biliary dilation. Say, so, okay, should we do an ERCP to try to go after that duct? Then you look at the T1 images on the MRI and you realize that really all of that area, uh, what you're seeing there is tumor involvement from HCC. And so even though the ducts are dilated, this patient was not going to be well served by us going after it. In fact, may increase the rate of complications. And we had a conversation with the oncologist saying, can you just start a different treatment at this bilirubin level and uh, instead of going too aggressive with ERCP or IR drainage? And that's what they did. So instead of just going after bilateral drainage, really think about it in terms of which sector do you want to drain uh, in, in that liver. And again, cross-sectional imaging beforehand can be quite helpful for that. We'll turn next to what type of stent to use, metal stent or plastic stent. The theoretical benefits of metal stents are that they're more flexible and conforming. There's more side holes for drainage compared to plastic stents, which depending on which model you use may not have as many holes. The wider diameter, um, you know, the ones we use are typically eight or 10 millimeters, and they're generally easier to place rather than trying to shove multiple plastic stents into one sector. Uh, because they're wider, maybe there's less bile flow obstruction and potentially less future cholangitis, and there's less stent migration because of the design of the stents. Now, disadvantage, that design is that these stents must be uncovered. You can't put a covered stent across the hilum because you're gonna jail off side branches. So these are uncovered and therefore permanent. And we'll look in a minute about, it's important to know what in your inventory, whether you're using uh, a closed cell design, uh, which are the ones that really kind of foreshorten as they expand, or if it's an open cell design, because it'll kind of affect how you uh, place those stents. Now, in reality, I, my practice is I rarely use metal stents for hyalur strictures. I think maybe a couple of times a year, personally. 
And despite uh, meta-analysis showing that the patency rates are higher and occlusion rates are lower with lower reintervention, the reality is that we found that newer chemotherapeutic agents mean, again, cholangiocarcinoma, carcinoma, for example, is not an immediate death now the way that it used to be. And we have patients that have stage four disease that are surviving years and years and years. And once you've placed metal stents, it's significantly difficult, more difficult in that subsequent ERCP to re-intervene compared to pulling out plastic stents and then you get to kind of get a fresh stab at those ducts. Um, there is a higher rate of percutaneous rescue for patients that have had previous metal stent. And though, yes, there'll be fewer procedures because of the longer patency, there's no clear survival benefit. And then lastly, I think this has probably driven more of the decisions rather than anything else, which is when I have a discussion with patients, particularly early on in their diagnosis, saying, I could put these metal stents and it means you don't have to come back, or I could put plastic stents and we're going to be doing stent exchanges. Often that permanence uh, kind of goes along with the patient's hope for improvement. And it's often the patients that are actually guiding the decision to avoid metal stents, particularly earlier in their treatment course. So in, in practice, while I don't, uh, you know, I, I do offer this and I do discuss this with patients typically pretty early on, um, I, I actually have rarely needed to, to, to switch to this or have patients opt for it. So um, similarly, the ASG guidelines therefore recommend that metal stent placement may be appropriate for those that have a shorter life expectancy, three months or less, uh, to avoid the need or the potential complications of plastic stents, or those patients that wish to avoid <coughs> repeated intervention. So I consider that choice to really be a shared decision rather than going purely off uh, data. And I think that is a point of debate and probably practice difference even amongst institutions. Now, some technical considerations. Here's my approach to how I attack a high stricture. First, is that robust informed consent decision, just like the one I just had? Usually, if it's the first time I'm going to attack a high stricture, I, I, I let the patient know I'm going to do a plastic stent to make sure that where my stents land are actually going to be effective. Um, review the imaging, as we've discussed, to in, uh, determine my intended targets. And not just looking at uh, which ducts I'm going to go after, but which segments of the liver look like they're most likely to be helping. And that's important because it might actually be that two stents in the right side, the right anterior and right posterior, may actually be just as good as bilateral stenting. So kind of having a plan of which segments I'm going after, not just based on the duct size is important. Next uh, is selected uh, biliary cannulation and then a limited contrast injection distally just to confirm I am in the bile duct and not in some third space or something of that nature. Uh, I perform biliary sphincterotomy and maintain access. Um, access is the first challenge, but there's several challenges to go with hyalur strictures. And then start to get selective sectoral duct wire access. So this may be wire on each side or maybe three wires going right anterior, right posterior, and the left. Over each wire, a selective cholangiogram, trying to minimize contrast injection to confirm that I'm in the right segments. And then uh, once I get wire access where I want it, I'll then start working on getting a better wire access. Again, going after targets that I have a mental image of from the MRCP or from something that I see, ooh, that, that looks like a better duct to put a stent into. Maybe it's a straighter shot. Maybe it's more dilated. Uh, I typically will then dilate over each wire to four millimeters or six millimeters. There's some evidence to suggest that that will help you not only place the stent, but increase the patency uh, after the stent's placed. And I go after the harder turns or the more laterally uh, oriented segments uh, first. So for example, I'll go after the left hepatic duct before I'll go after the right hepatic duct with the stent. Because of, think about the way that the forces are transmitted up the duct, you're gonna have more mechanical advantage sending a stent straight up the right anterior hepatic duct than you will kind of making the turn in the left. And then if there's, you know, I don't typically give antibiotics to all of these. I know some people that do, but if I'm not happy with how the drainage is, or if I've got areas where contrast is just not coming out so much, or if it's multifocal obstructions, then typically we'll put them on either at least a one-time dose or a short course of antibiotics. There's many strategies. I think this is going to be a, a, a discussion point amongst endoscopists of how to get that selective, optimal sectoral duct access, but it may be angled wires, different catheters, different cannula tomes. Um, and when needed, uh, if really needed, sometimes we'll break out cholangioscopy to do direct visualization of a duct to access it. And then at times, it, you may need to do something like a rendezvous, or so an EUS guided rendezvous, or an IR rendezvous, where they'll put, put a wire down where you want to reach, and then you can use that wire to cannulate beside or over to get access to that duct. Or if we're really not having success, sometimes I'll send the patient to IR, and then you can use that drain, the internal portion of the drain, as a roadmap and also maybe beside it to kind of cannulate that duct. And then once you've got a stent there, you can remove the drain as long as that tract is matured. So these are all strategies. 
Now, if you are deciding to go for the metal stent, there's a few, uh, there's a couple different ways. You could do side-by-side -side configuration or the stent and stent configuration, as you see here in the picture, to create a Y, you know, basically bridging the hilum and the left and the right. I think that side-by-side -side may be slightly easier if you can get that second introducer to pass because here, both your wires are up and you just slide a stent up, deploy it, slide a stent up, deploy it. Whereas with the stent in stent, you have to pass the wire through the side of the stent, as you can see there. Now the stent and stent really is only practical if you have an open cell laser cut, not foreshortening self-expanding metal stent like the ones here. So um, it is important to understand what you have in your inventory, what type of stent each brand or each model is, because it can be hard to get through the side holes, or even if you can get through the side holes of one of the foreshortening type stents, it's such a strong design that your second stent is not gonna open all the way. It's gonna stay pinched, and even if you try to dilate it, et cetera. So it does, uh, kind of guide which, which strategy you maybe use. The stent and stent, because you can see there's only one common channel in the common duct there, may be easier to re-intervene because you just stick a, a catheter or a balloon up there and you're within your stents um, if you land it in a super papillary position. But for side by side, you know, you have two stents in there, it may be hard to get into one. So typically what we'll try to do is to make sure that both of those stent channels are crossing the hilum. Maybe you can get away with two long ones that get all the way down, or we'll actually place two on each side, kind of overlapping, so you kind of complete the entire Y and stent all the way from the duodenum up through the hilum. And I like to make sure that, the, and again, this is why I don't use these stents, especially in the first procedure. It's really nice when you know that your targets are the right targets with having plastic stents there first before you go after it, because these are un uncovered and permanent. The data, which technique to use, overall I think is equivocal. So I don't. I think it's based more on your comfort, your expertise, and what inventory you may have available. So here's a recent case example where a patient actually was doing very well with plastic stents, and those were well positioned. Billy Rubin was normal, getting chemotherapy, but goals of care discussion wanted to switch over to plastic uh, to metal, and so we have selective duct cannulation, uh, cholangiogram on either side, kind of showing, yep, those are those are good targets, and then side by side metal stent that uh, in this case happened to land all the way across the hilum. So in summary, kind of the considerations that I, I use when I'm attacking a, a malignant hyalur stricture, first and foremost is to consider the possibility of future surgery to guide both how I'm gonna sample that tumor and also to make sure that I'm not gonna place metal stents in a, in a liver that may be undergoing surgery at some point. Plan the targets with imaging, with the goal of draining at least 50% of the liver volume. And instead of thinking just left and right, think in terms of what sectors, the three sectors, left, right anterior, right posterior, and not just about dilated ducts. It's not just about dilated ducts, but what is the liver looking like in those health segments going after viable liver and avoiding non-viable liver. Avoid excess contrast injection above the hilum and avoiding atrophic segments to avoid and reduce the risk of cholangitis. Be very clear, have a shared discussion with the patient on when you're gonna use the self-expanding metal stents. And then if you are gonna be using pl uh, plastic stents, make sure that you have a plan for follow-up to do the stent exchanges, which in our institution is typically every two to three months. Thank you very much for listening and uh, look forward to meeting you again.